All right. I think we can get started. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to my talk, Algorithmic Alchemy, Transforming Drug Discovery with Open AI. My name is Gloria Masia. I am a technical lead at the pharmaceutical company Hoffman La Roche. Uh, we come from beautiful, colorful Barcelona, and I'm based in amazing Zurich. The views I'm representing here today are my own opinions. They do not necessarily need to be shared with my employer. Um, I'm, I'm an open source lover. I'm a patient advocate. Um, I'm a person who suffers from a chronic disability. And in these 30 minutes, I'm going to try to make you fall in love with drug development. I cannot make you an expert in it in 30 minutes, but I can definitely make you fall in love with it. So why algorithmic alchemy, right? And I think I chose the word because of the ancient meaning of alchemy, this blend of science, philosophy, a point of mysticism of those people who try to transform base metals into gold and achieve immortality. And yet it's true. While alchemy wasn't, or why its goal wasn't scientifically realized, alchemists did set the basis for modern chemistry, right? And I would argue when you think about it, drug development is alchemy, right? Because we do try to prolong people's lives. We try to improve their quality of lives and those who manage are richly rewarded, much like a modern version of those alchemists that wanted to transform base metals into goals, right? And we have seen a massive shift in the last 50 years in the pharmaceutical industry, right? Going from traditional chemical synthesis to biotechnology, in which we use like living systems and organisms, right? And these have given us amazing drugs. I mean, biologics are now the gold standard. We also have like cell gene therapies. So it's incredibly, incredibly exciting to be in this industry and alive right now. Now, I would argue we are moving to the start of a new era that I'm going to call it algorithmic alchemy, right? In which AI will play a crucial role now. Truth be told, AI in drug development has been going on for a while, right? And the sad part is that so far it falls short in the clinic, right? And to me, this is the real measure of success when you have a drug in the clinic, right? And so far, what we have seen, what we have seen is some promise and yet some disappointments, right? So, I mean, you can think about companies like Benevolent AI, that they had the alacnidal like, trial on dermatitis and yet they did not manage to beat placebo or extension in the UK for cancer drug development, right? And, and I will be talking about it now. I, I will be explaining why I think that this happened. I don't think it's because of the amazing people who are behind these companies, I think is how we, as a society, maybe built up that hype, right? But I think we are living a very exciting moment, but because while these promises have not been realized yet, I think we are coming very close to this point in time. So, and the reason why I believe that is because three years ago, something absolutely incredible happened um, by the DeepMind team with a model called AlphaFold that made the newspapers to pretty much everywhere in the world, right? And I think this is one of these scientifically, in medicine, incredible moments, right? Now, to really appreciate why it was so incredible, what they did, we need to take a step back and go to the very beginning and talk very quickly about proteins and proteins folding, right? So proteins are molecules in our body. They are very important because they carry out a whole lot of functions, right? From the digestive enzymes to the antibodies, from transporting oxygen to hormones, all of that are proteins, right? And what I put on the right side is, um, is the 3D structure of myoglobin, which is the protein that carries oxygen in our muscles, right? And I will be picking up this example and we will be walking through it through the presentation, right? So just, just remember it. And I wanna say that this structure here from, from PDB, one of these databases, was experimentally 
determined, right? Meaning this was probably the work, the hard work of a PhD student, in this case with X-ray diffraction, but you would also see sometimes with nuclear magnetic resonance, right? But it was an experimental work. Now, a bit more about proteins, and then we complete this short capstone, is that you should know that they have different levels of a structure, right? They have what we call the primary structure, kind of like a 1D structure of basically groups of amino acids. So think about like a necklace, and then its amino acids would be like one bit in its chain, right? And each amino acid has like a group amino, like a group acid, and then a variable residue, right? So when we abbreviate it, usually we just write the variable part, which is this residue, right? So it could be like an alanine, a glycine. And then we can use the full name, we can use the three letter code, or we can use just one letter, right? And the, and the magic of it is that in human bodies we find only about 20 of them, right? So kind of like keep this one, the idea, finite problem, a few letters in mind, then these chains, these single chains, they fall into what we call secondary abstract structures. And here I put like beta sheet and alpha helix because they are by far the most common and they keep folding in what we call then tertiary structures, right? And in some cases, in many proteins actually, tertiary structures of monomers, they come together like pieces in a Lego set and they will do what we call then quaternary structures, right? So for instance, myoglobin would be here, but then later we will see hemoglobin, right? Which has a quaternary structure. Um, so with that in mind, we can kind of like come to appreciate why what they did was so amazing, right? And it takes us back to the 70s and this Nobel Prize of Chemistry, Amphison saying, I have this theory saying that from the 1D structure of a protein, the sequence of amino acids, we should be able to computationally predict its structure, right? And then about the same year, I mean, he said in 72, three years before, someone said Levinthal postulated what would be a big paradox. He said, well, I mean, like, if we were to, it would take us longer than the age of the known universe to enumerate all the possible conformations a protein can fold on. And it's known as a paradox because yet, this in nature spontaneously happens in milliseconds, right? And this, I mean, I think this is one of these super exciting moments in biology because it's the start of these, one of these grand quests of these long standing problems, right? In which you had then in the scientific paper every, you know, like two weeks, somebody saying, we solve it, only to realize, oh, they haven't really solved it. They just took it one step further. So there was this group of people that said, look, like, we need to here create like a benchmark. Let's do like a competition. Um, so that we can clearly define what it means to have solved it and how well one team does versus the other, right? And this was a bit the idea behind the CASP competition, right? And people had been participating for a while, like five decades, 50 years. And then one day, the team of the mind participated and these were the results they achieved, right? So that's them and that's the other teams, right? And I will be explaining a bit more about the metric, the global distance test, but for now, understand it a bit like accuracy, and what you see here with the sum, sum of set scores, understand it as for every target, so for every protein I wanna predict the structure, and hence the sum, how well this team is doing versus the other in terms of accuracies, right? And here you see the massive difference, right? And you can imagine how exciting is for the organizers and, and for the community to see something like this, right? And it's not only how well they did versus the others, right? It's also that they did so well that the organizers said the challenge as we initially set it up, it's now solved, right? Because they achieved in, in, the, in the score of the global distance test 92.4 and f more than 90 was already considered the solution, right? And what this metric means that I told you is kind of like accuracy is like the percentage of residues that you, that you computationally predict compared to the experimentally determined structure that you don't know that is hidden from you, but, it's, but the organizers of the competition know. And then what you predict versus what is known, that it's within a threshold distance, right? A threshold distance that they had an average error 
of about the width of an atom, right? So that's how well they did for single protein chains. And we will talk more about like that, right? But I just want to say this is incredible, right? And I think that this to me feels a bit like probably the first time that somebody did that, right? It's like when I think in sports, we have these beautiful moments of like <laughs> that are completely amazing, right? And and I think for me seeing the the results was just as watching for the first time somebody who decided to do pole vaulting backwards, right? It's it's not only how surprising it was probably for the people to see, but then realizing how well it works and then everybody starts doing it, right? So it's this change. And I mean not only they created this amazing model, but they were also in terms of very generous. So here is the share of experimentally determined structures, right? Which was about 200K. And those are the ones that they could use to train the model, right? Then shortly after, they added to a publicly accessible database in collaboration with the European Bioinformatics Institute, they added one million more, right? And then shortly after, they added 200 million more, right? So what these circles show you is the difference in what was previously experimentally known to which, like, they, what they added computationally, right? Um, so, and I think, I mean, the, it's just incredible. Now, <laughs> I mean, if everything had been solved, what would be the fun, right? So I, I told you before to think about myoglobin, and we are also going to talk about hemoglobin. And I'm just going to touch very quickly on like a couple of the limitations that AlphaFold 2 had, right? Um, and one very important one is that it was to predict the three destruction of proteins, but proteins very often have ligands, right? Like small molecules with whom they play, so to say. And for instance, in the case of myoglobin that carries oxygen in our muscles, the heme group is very important because it has an iron ion and it's actually this group that binds to oxygen, right? So if you want to understand the function of a protein, it's very <laughs> difficult to do it without these ligands, right? And then I also said that graph that I was showing from the competition was of single chain proteins, right? But very often, and you have it here in the case of hemoglobin, you have in this case two alpha chains combined with two beta chains and then four heme groups, right? So how these different chains play together, um, it's also very important because it's a reality in many of the proteins, right? And I could keep adding, I mean, it's also the fact that proteins do not only interact with other proteins, they also interact with RNA, they also interact with DNA, right? So, and they also interact with many other molecules. Structures are not static, structures are a living thing. They have like post-translational modifications. They go through processes, right? So, I mean, it's an amazing first step. It's way more than a first step, but there is a still a lot to be done, right? And here is where the open source community came in. There was, for instance, a model called Alpha Field that what it was doing um, was to transplant these ligands into the alpha fold predicted structures, right? So it was aligning the sequence, and if the alignment was good enough, then it was trying to transplant the ligands into the protein structure, right? Another point the open source community came in is because the first AlphaFold model code was in TensorFlow. The AlphaFold took code. There was a significant delay till the moment that code got published, but it was in JAX, right? And there was, for instance, the team of OpenFold that said, we are going to do it in PyTorch, right? Because that's where we have the, the base, the mass of the research community, right? Then there was another team like Rosetta Fold DNA that said, let's try now to predict protein DNA interactions, right? Same for RNA. So in a way, this set, it was kind of like the shot at the beginning of the race. And then like out of this initial idea, there was a fantastic ideation process of different people trying to say, what can we do? What are the limitations? How can we push the boundary a bit further, right? Now, very recently, uh, DeepMind, in collaboration with Isomorphics Lab, which is a company that also belongs to the Alphabet Group, released AlphaFold 3, right? And AlphaFold 3 in itself already 
addresses many of the limitations that AlphaFold2 had. It allows for more tokens. It considers interactions with, for instance, DNA protein. It allows for a finite set of ligands, right? But it also comes with a couple of caveats, right? For instance, the code is not uh, publicly accessible, right? And I'll talk about more in the future. Um, and then not only the, I mean, the model and the code is not accessible or the architecture details are barely disclosed, but um, it's also the fact that you interact through it with a UI, right? And then there is a quota. You can do up to only 20 predictions per day. And I mean, that's very little. I mean, it doesn't, you don't need to be in the field to understand that probably like 20 predictions is something you do in like an hour in the morning or even less, right? So this is not something that really allows to, to experiment. It allows to you to play a bit and see, the, and see the promise, but it's not something that it really allows you to do research and development work in, in the drug development space. Now, I recorded for you a very short demo to, to make things a bit more tangible, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm going to Uniprot, which is a database of protein sequences. And you can see here those letters. That's the amino acid sequence, right? Those variable residues that I was telling you sometimes are abbreviated by one letter. And I'm trying to like 3D predict the structure of hemoglobin that has two alpha chains and two beta chains. Here I'm taking the beta chain, so before I took the alpha one, so I copy it, I put it in the alpha fold server, and I'm saying it's a protein, and I want two copies. So two copies of alpha, two copies of beta. Then I have a ligand that we were talking before, which is the heme group, right, out of which I need four copies, right? Um, and that's pretty much it. Then you can start the compute job, right? You get to review and you accept, and you see also here the quota. And he, here what I did is instead of waiting the minute it takes for the job to run, I had previously run another one, hemoglobin, so I'm just like selecting you and I'll show you the results of this one, right? And I want you to, to come to appreciate that, I mean, it did this <laughs> structure prediction only from the sequence of 1D amino acids, right? And it was, and it, managed to put all the single chains correctly in space and also put the heme groups correctly in space, right? This is, this is very, very impressive. And then, I mean, minorly, but they also basically use like um, a color match, like what you see here in these beautiful colors, they basically have like uh, a confidence metric so that you know as a scientist how much you can trust the different regions of the prediction, right? And this is also something, this metric, that then you see most of these open source models also adopted to have like a common standard, right? And you can even know then for a particular residue. I mean, so far for a very short um, demo. Yeah. And now, before I told you, so far, AI drug design hasn't leap up to the hype. And I think this is a sad, but yet fair statement. <laughs> and I think, um, because maybe we didn't build up in society enough understanding of what it means to, to bring a drug to the market, right? And I mean, here I've put you the whole kind of like drug development funeral, which is probably a figure you've seen other times. And I mean, and it's a funeral because very few, let's say, potential hits made it then to the final stage and becomes a drug in the market, right? It's a, if you ask me, it's a very inefficient. I mean, if you if these were to think of it as like a manufacturing process, I mean, horrible efficiency, right? How <laughs> how much we lose, and and how much potential there is for us as technologists to improve it, right? Um, and then if you think about AlphaFold, that can be, or AlphaFold, OpenFold, RosettaFold, like any of these fold, so to say, models, I mean, you will realize that basically where they help you in this process is more or less in this preclinical stage, right? Um, from undisclosed targets, you can try to find some interesting hits and then possibly optimize them a bit, them into leads and so on. But, and what I listed on the right is basically all the, all, a very high level list of the steps that go into the preclinical phase, right? So I think that in a way, like no wonder that until yet AI has has not managed to radically revolutionize the show. It has, it's a, it's a very long 
and challenging process with many phases and many steps in its phase, right? So I think so far what we've seen is how we can become incredibly much more efficient at some of these steps. But what we need is to radically improve the entire process, right? Now, I mean, where are we going? Are things perfect? What is the open source community doing besides what I explained it, right? So, I mean, I think in terms of where are we going, pharma is becoming more like tech, right? So very recently, Eli Lilly and Novartis did two partnerships with Isomorphics Lab, right? So the company that developed the AlphaFold model. And basically, I mean, you can read the details of the, of the deal, hide it. Um, what, uh, so there is a part of the, so it's a bunch of like undisclosed targets, right? So they are trying to predict heats and then leads for these undisclosed targets. Then they get an upfront payment for that of 45 million, uh, almost 38 million in the other case. And then they also get performance based milestones, right? Which, which is very common in drug development. It means like if you give me a drug candidate and you manage to pass the toxicology tests, I pay you a bit more. If you manage to pass the in vitro tests, I pay you a bit more, right? And then if the drug makes it to the market, in this case, they also get like double digit royalties, right? So it means you even get more. This is a very high deal. Like most deals you will see, I mean, if these were in the company behind Alpha 4, if this were just like another CEO, another provider, it's between 10 and 30 million, right? So, I mean, I'm just helping you because when I see these numbers are really high, right? So I think it's important to reference them with like other numbers that you see in this kind of deal to realize who is paying a premium for what. Um, and then on the other end, tech is becoming more like pharma, picking up some naughty habits of this industry. Like for instance, not publishing the code, right? And then nature got a big backslash of why did you publish this article if there was no details or few details on the architecture and there wasn't the code and there was and there is actually an open letter by the scientific community saying publish the code and the pressure at some point got so high that basically <laughs> the deep mind team had to say we are going to publish it in six months from now and then Sumit said very nice <laughs> right so and then, and then, of course, this race of who's going to crack the code, who's going to eat up that margin, who's going to catch up with those innovations, right? Um, so it's very exciting. And then, and yet tech is becoming more like pharma, right? Because, for instance, this is from last week. Isomorphic Labs is now hiring the head of intellectual property, right? Which is, which is such a pharma thing. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's nice to see how both industries in, in this space are converging. Um, and, uh, and trying to understand why this happens to some extent, um, I really liked, I saw in a talk from Brian Contrio, this, uh, sorry, in a, in a blog post, this title of open source is confronting its midlife crisis, right? And I'd kind of like try to look for an example to illustrate that very well. And it's the drama or the reality of hyper clouds that are service wrapping open source uh, software projects, right? And then this, of course, has the problem of like if those open source projects had created a company and they are trying to monetize themselves that software to make it sustainable, then I mean the hyper clouds start competing with them, right? And as a reaction, we've seen them to go away from let's say Apache 2.0 licenses to Foxpen licenses to to prevent that from happening to which we have also seen the cloud counter which is to say oh you do that then fork you right create an independent fork of that project and continue from the last premises access the development on their own right and i put here the case of like open search elastic search but i mean you can uh, same with like mongodb document db and so on right so I mean, what is the future, right? And how, how this relates to the wall of AlphaFall, OpenFall, AI drug development, right? So, I mean, few messages. 
I mean, I also like once a lot a talk from Brendan O'Leary, and he was saying, okay, let's try to see what elements make an open source software project more resistant of being commoditized, right, or service wrap by hyperclouds. And he was saying, well, it's have, for instance, many use cases with some proprietary functionality, or to have many proprietary features, or um, the interaction through a user interface. And then, of course, if your buyers are quite price insensitive, or if your users of that software really contribute to open source themselves. Now, I want you to kind of like have these five statements in mind and think about the moves AlphaFold has been doing, right, with AlphaFold server. And then if you think of the pharma industry as the user or the client of that industry, of that server, like how many of these then statements apply to terms in terms of their buying power or their like user base, right? Um, and this is also, and, and this is of course not only good for them, but for anyone who wants to develop such models and make those open source projects and points sustainable, right? And um, yes, and also to, to, to isomorphic labs, to alpha fault server, I mean, I think when, when I, I read the, the server output terms of use, because I'm the kind of person who reads these kind of things, uh, because, I mean, I really like regulation, I'm a health economist as well, right? So I have a kind of, I like these things. And I mean, anybody knows that commercial use is not necessarily for profit. Like, there is a very important distinction here, right? I mean, you can sell something just not to run at loss. So, which brings us to the next interesting idea, which is, have you ever wondered how kind of like pharma companies decide to develop one drug and not another? And how do they set the price, right? And I mean, health economists would kill me, but I would argue this can be summarized more or less like in one minute. I mean, if you kind of like take out a lot of the other very important factors that go into it, right? But it's essentially a multiplication between how many patients will get that drug and at which price I'm gonna sell that drug, right? And this number and you know your company size, because you do have a structure that you need to sustain, will decide where you go for it or not. And then of course, in each of those two numbers, there is a lot of magic, right? In the patient population, it goes as in the, am I the only person who's selling that drug or do I have many competitors in the market? Will my drug be given as a first line treatment? Will, it, will I be given as the first drug? Or will I be given after two other drugs, meaning many of the patients might have died, many of the patients might not get me, they might get another one, right? So this has a lot of magic in there. And then the price side of the equation is of course, how much medical need there is, how much can I ask for it? How much, um, how much are my competitors asking for it? Am I radically better? Can I then hence ask for a premium price? Or am I kind of the same, but a bit late to the game and I have to offer the same cheaper? so that they get me, right? And the sad part of all of it is that many times the drug math adds up, and that's why we have seen, I mean, we have seen so many amazing drugs hit the market in the last 50 years, right? There is no better time to be alive in this sense. But there are many conditions for which the drug math doesn't add up, right? I'm talking, for instance, about tropical diseases that affect only certain geographies. And I mean, if, if those conditions were also to, to happen in that prevalence in Europe, I'm completely sure we would have a drug, right? And, you know, by open sourcing these models, by thinking cleverly of the licenses and the terms of use, we give opportunity to foundations to non-profit organizations to pick up those challenges, right? Uh, which <laughs> brings us, for instance, to kind of like reviewing a bit one of these very famous open source models, which is OpenFold, right? And I told you already a bit of like, it's a story, but I just wanted to highlight here a couple elements, because I think they are interesting points to reflect. First one is how do they define themselves? So they say it's a non-profit AI research and development consortium. Now it's interesting because you know, like a consortium is not a foundation. A consortium is not like 
like a, a limited company. A consortium is a fancy way of saying we are a big group of people that have a few things in common and many things we disagree, right? So uh, it's important to say how will these evolve? How will these advance? And I think this is interesting, right? Because it has how you define who plays in that consortium and the terms of collaboration has a lot to do then with your license, right? Which as of now is Apache 2.0, right? Which then puts you somewhat at risk of being commoditized if you don't think about things cleverly enough, or it might be the statement you want to make, right? But then you need to plan, so to say, the sustainability of your project accordingly. I think, in my humble opinion, there is nothing wrong in one approach or the other, as long as you, then got, you don't get caught by surprise, right? Um, and then, I mean, interestingly, like if you look at the hyperclouds that are supporting the, the, op the fantastic OpenFold initiative that I admire a lot, uh, I mean, you have AWS and you have Microsoft, but you don't have Google, right? And, and I mean, I'll, just, I'll just let you kind of like your thoughts. Is this like an, a statement to open science or is it like a prep of something that they just want to commoditize when it gets mature enough, right? Now, something that I've seen being very passionate about open source then in the pharma world is we need to rethink how we do partnerships. I mean, there are other ways of doing pharma deals that what we've done in the past, right? And I think this needs to come both ways. It needs to come from, from people who are execs in pharma saying, yes, I want to support open source because I see the value that this adds to my pipeline. Um, but it also needs to come from the other side of like open source projects, understanding the, the corporate processes that companies go through to support, right? That we cannot simply send money to a GitHub repo, right? That there needs to be somewhat of an infrastructure. And then here, I mean, out of no particular individual reason, simply because I liked a lot how clean the graphics were on their website, because I liked how clean their communications materials were. I, I chose the open source collective that have this one light statement of like, we are fiscal hosting for open source projects, right? So I think for anyone wanting to do open AI, drug development, this is the kind of like initiative we need to keep exploring. And then of course, pharma companies speed up with procurement and get more and more familiar to supporting this kind of absolutely amazing initiatives, right? Um, yes. Kind of like finishing note, personal one in terms of like wishes, right? I think there is still a lot of unmet need out there, right? In this country and in many others, right? I mean, as I said in the, in the beginning, I suffer from a chronic condition out of which there is no cure yet, right? And I want to die with a cure. This is kind of like one of my life goals. And I think it's the life goal of so many chronic patients, right? So we are not there yet. I also have a lovely grandfather who doesn't remember my name. And he also doesn't remember many of the memories, like this one, we live together, right? So I think there is so much we can do yet. So I was thinking, how do we measure that? What should be the real challenge of AI drug development? What should be the real competition? And I mean, I think CASP is great, but I think CASP is a proxy, right? I think any data science or computer science challenge hackathon competition is a very good proxy. But what ultimately for me will determine where AI drug development drops it is this list, right? So the World Health Organization has a list of essential medicines, right? And I can tell you about it as like a health economist, like of course not every healthcare system can afford all the medications that we have out there, right? So what the World Health Organization does is to say, let's create a list of those medications that every country in the world, even if you don't have that much money, should try to make available to your citizens, right? And this independent evaluation has a lot of value. So in a way, for a pharma company, for a drug development, for an algorithmic alchemist, once your drug is in that list, it means you've made it. Because you improve like no other drug 
millions and millions of lives, right? So I would say, in my opinion, AI drug development will have to accomplish its hype when we see one of its drugs being adopted into one of these lists, right? So, with this, I will conclude my thought. Um, I hope you liked it. If so, feel free to connect with me either online or even better in person. I'm based in lovely Zurich, and I really like making new friends, going for hikes, skiing in the winter, right? So if you're there, please do let me know. I do go for hikes and skiing with strangers, so it won't be the first time. Um, and then, of course, also thanks to my friend Altair Hernandez, who is um, a PhD candidate for having very constructive talks with me and content validating some of this work here. So thank you, Altar, and thank you to all of you for your attendance. <laughs>